Yeah, I was proud. I mean, my dad worked for the CIA, you know. I don't uh, pretend to think that we would have had a very successful marriage, uh, even if we had not been in the CIA. He could go along with it so far, and then personal benefits were out. It was strictly a matter of principle. I learned he was a CIA officer this last year. Oh, good. Fine. Good. I gotta, I gotta find out some things that he did, you know. <laughs> I've been straight all my life in terms of uh, working my way through college and, and uh, the Gates Rubber Company was a conservative company, a good one, and, and very conservative, straight, the Marine Corps, uh, and then 12 years in the CIA, uh, a team man, uh, an organization man, I think with my own individuality. Crossing a plane, we saw an equivalent of a wild turkey. So he raised his 22 and shot from the cab and dropped the bird in its tracks. And then he called to his uh, friend up on top of the load of lumber. The first one to it gets it. And that was quite a race because it meant a lot to both of them. Bob won by maybe a yard. And <clears throat> so we shared the bird with the other missionaries. Things like that in their experience and background that they couldn't get over here. And then his mother could tell you some stories about some of his adventures. First time he wanted to go on a, an antelope hunt. Well, it was a place where they drove quite a ways in the car and then had to walk. And uh, uh, never had any of the missionary children gone. And I said, why, Bob, of course you can't go. He says, now, Mother, you told me that I'd live until God was ready for me to end this life, and I want to go. And uh, we let him go. He killed an antelope, and in the night, here came this great commotion in the yard, and he had sent some pathogens in with his antelope. He wasn't 15 years old. So you went from a clean upbringing into a world of dirty tricks in your mature life. Yeah. But the key thing is that as you get recruited into the CIA, it never occurs to you that if you're, if you're as naive as I was, uh, and I think most of the young men that come into the CIA are, it never occurs to you that you're getting into a world of dirty tricks. You, the, the come on that they have, the, the, the things they use to sell is that you're finally getting into the elite inner circles of the United States government. All your life you've been going through the amateurs and the prelims and the the prep schools, in effect, and finally, this is it. This is where the people are real pros, the frontline warriors uh, saving the nation from communism. The Phoenix program was created by the CIA, and its purpose was to kill and terrorize. In Vietnam, I was forced to do business with a police chief who was a sadistic uh, mutilator of, uh, of prisoners. He liked to carve them up and throw the remains in the river. And he was completely paid and propped up by the CIA. His whole career depended on, one, controlling that operation so that the CIA needed him, and two, uh, the CIA propping him up and funding him. And uh, he did his uh, 
knife work in a CIA safe house. He called it the pink house. I reported this to the chief of station. He said, well, you know, it's a rough world, and sometimes you have to do business with people that really aren't your first choice of uh, the kind of people you want to associate with. So don't make a way. And so I went back, you know, what do I do? Resign my post? Yeah, you know, that's obviously, that's your last vote, though. You resign and you're out. Uh, and I wasn't ready to give up my career yet. I terminated the safe house. I told uh, case officers that I don't want to hear about it. If this guy has a compulsion to do this sort of thing anymore, uh, I don't want to hear about it. How does the CIA go about recruiting its future candidates for officers and agents? Mm. Mm. Have, have any of y'all been approached here? Has the recruiters come through here and talk to you? <laughs> <laughs> no, but, um, um, heard, you know, somebody in this room might be sweating right now because he's been told, you know, if they ask you don't to say anything. I hear that they do use professors to uh, keep eyes out in their classes for um, particular students who might be uh, interested in that sort of work. But I wonder how, were you approached here at the university or were you approached sometime later in your career? At the university, a CI recruiter came through. I went and talked to them. He did not write my name down. And in 64, early 64, I got a letter in the mail saying, would I mind if the CI did a security check? Uh, and I wrote back saying, I was restless, and I wrote back saying I'd be delighted if it was uh, uh, for possible employment. With my background, there were fields where I would be unique. <laughs> From the Congo, I went to the University of Texas and enrolled in the ROTC program. I graduated in 1959 and took a commission in the Marine Corps. I didn't see my future as a career officer, so when my term was up, I accepted an offer as a junior executive at the Gates Rubber Company and went with my family to Colorado. We were very young and idealistic with three children when the CIA first approached us. We were in the Marine Corps for three years and did not want to go the military route, although there was a very promising career there. When you think about his job being a career or national security, I think that at the time the emphasis was career. I think that uh, most of what he did was for the next fitness report, so to speak. I think that uh, people generate activity that is unnecessary overseas. Uh, in order to have some activity on their fitness report and they really don't get promoted within the CIA unless they have so many recruitments, let's say, in a tour of duty or uh, so many operations or ops as they call them. The way the CIA works, you're promoted on the basis of your fitness report, which you get every few months or at the end of every assignment, uh, at least once a year, usually more often. And this evaluates your performance both with a letter grade and also a written narrative. That and the assignments you get will, will develop your career. I said, why don't you just go in there and tell them that this is immoral and this is something you can't do. And he said, well, they don't want, you're not going to get anywhere in your career if you say no to assignments. And by that time, though, he was uh, hooked by the CIA and the assignments were sexy assignments and interesting assignments. In one post, we put seven bugs in a foreign embassy. It was a quite dramatic and very exciting. And we had officers and support officers and technicians flying all over Africa on this thing. And we got them in. Of the seven bugs that we installed, clean, we never got caught, uh, five of them never came up on the air. They were totally defective. The sixth one uh, would transmit, but you, the, the switch, the activator to shut off the thing when no one was speaking uh, was defective, so it burned out its batteries in the course of about six weeks' time and went off the air. And one of them functioned properly. And that one, although it was in an ambassador's office of a country that was very much a target of intelligence uh, activities, that one never produced a single disseminable report. I felt like I was really making time uh, professionally. I was a very young officer when I met my first president. We had a mutual interest. There were things I could do for him, and uh, there were things he could do for us, at least in terms of making me feel secure in his country. If I was meeting him and he appreciated what I was doing for him, it wasn't likely that he was going to throw me out if I made a mistake or got caught. And uh, it was pretty heady stuff for a very young officer. 
And uh, it meant that uh, I was getting uh, recognition back at headquarters, obviously. You know, there's young Stockwell who's meeting President X. And we better keep our eye on Stockwell. He looks good. My function at home, when agents would come to the home, would be to turn on the uh, record player and be sure that uh, the curtains were closed and uh, that there was enough security in my own home that the person wouldn't, uh, you know, be compromised by having come to our home. Um, I didn't really, at that time, I didn't realize uh, that we would be putting these people in danger and that some would be put in jail and that some would be dead. A lot of other things happen in the world that's sort of like somebody pushing a rock off the cliff and the rock hits somebody and uh, and then, you know, they step back and say, I didn't kill him, uh, the, the rock killed him. And uh, this is sort of what happened in Ghana. The, the agency, to my knowledge, did not write a paper saying, let's overthrow Nkrumah. The chief of station there was a very aggressive man and uh, he became aware of the fact that there was the possibility of a coup developing and he knew the players, uh, people who, in the army who were unhappy and he began to report and to, to ask for encouragement to encourage these men and as I understand it he was not given a formal permission to attempt to overthrow Nkrumah but he was given permission to monitor the developments of any coup and this gave him an excuse to, to meet these officers often, daily, several times a day, and to give them money, uh, and in effect to give them encouragement. The soft file is a file that doesn't have an official name on it or cryptonym on it, and is not registered into the agency's IBM system, the system of 201 numbers, so that it can't be traced if, if you come to the agency demanding to see your file, and if they have a soft file on you instead of a 201, you'll never get it. They may have a manila folder in there with, with reams of documents about you, and you'll never get access to it. There were times when I said, well, let's just get out of the CIA. You know, Bob, really you're making a decision which is it's, it's getting to the point where it's going to be the CIA or it's going to be our marriage, and he chose the CIA. What an opportunity. I was being asked to, to watch the ball, the Angolan ball game from the outset, how we got into it, what we, uh, the, all the rationalization and justification as well as the decision-making processes. I was to watch this game not from the 50-yard line, but from, from the, the field itself, a, a player coach. I mean, go into Angola and get in the action where the, where the people are, are groveling in the dust and, and losing their lives, as well as the high policy planning sessions in Washington. And uh, I was delighted to, to have the opportunity to, to sacrifice a year of my life to see just how the U.S. government does this sort of thing. The CIA went into Angola in July of 1975. We started out with $6 million, and eventually the total budget was $31 million. The first effort was arms that were sent from America to Kinshasa in U.S. Air Force C-141 planes. And then from Kinshasa, we hauled the arms into Angola in smaller airplanes. The total was uh, about 1,500 tons of arms, 30,000 rifles and small rockets and mortars. Our funds and arms were going to two of the three Angola factions. One of them hit it up by Holden Roberto, who had had a relationship with us for about 15 years, and to Savindi, who had not been well known by the CIA, who had the sole virtue of being in opposition to the MPLA, whom we were determined to oppose. President Mobutu of Zaire wanted this program. We bribed him. We gave him $2,750,000. CIA officers went in as advisors and trainers. They were called intelligence gatherers. But in fact, uh, they were preparing our allies for combat. I fled to San Salvador on January 16th. What did the enemy do in San Salvador? You mean what I saw? The Americans were there. How do you know they were Americans? 
se, se, como que sabe ser americano, porque quando vieram lá, porque quando eles viram, com os seus olhos, eles viram que eles eram americanos. E vimos que quando vieram, eram 20 americanos. Americanos, These Americans, what did they look like? Were they white? Were they black? Describe them. They were your color, comrade. They were not black. They had chestnut eyes. You know, white. There were not enough CIA advisors to make a great deal of difference, however, and we hired European mercenaries, and we tried to hire white Angolan refugees to go back in as mercenaries fighting on our side. The CIA collaborated with the South Africans, and it was not officially ordered by the National Security Council, but there was liaison at all levels. The CIA was nervous about the role the Senate might play in this war. Senator Clark on the Foreign Relations Committee made a trip to Africa to review the situation, a fact-finding trip to report to the Senate. The CIA watched him with some apprehension to see that he didn't get information we didn't want him to have. The Senate, led by Senator Clark, shut down the Angola program in December of 75. While the Senate was shutting us down, a uh, Cuban army eventually of 10 to 15,000 combat soldiers, MiG-21 aircraft, tanks, just swept over the FNLA and UNITA. And we lost decisively. A victory that will change the course of African history. The victory of the heroic people of Angola. Nevertheless, I think we could have uh, won the thing if we had gone in very quickly. When I went out there and came back, I recommended that, I said the forces are about equal right now. And if we go in with immediate, abundant support, we can win. We can take Luanda. By that, I meant tactical air and, and American advisors put in uh, several hundred troops very quickly and put in some of these really monstrous weapons, uh, airplanes, you know, that fly around shooting 8,000 rounds a minute down, and you'd have been into Luanda just like that. It appears, from what you said, that you advocated that the United States should go into Angola with large weapons, lots of firepower, a small detachment of Americans, and that your plan was rejected. And that was the final straw that did it for you. No, that's very definitely a, a misunderstanding. Uh, yesterday, we got distracted. We were into that, and then we didn't get a chance to pursue it, uh, probably changing of cameras or something. Uh, I was sick at my stomach that we were going into Angola. I was, dis I was depressed that the agency would be letting itself get dragged into another paramilitary adventure uh, that quickly after Vietnam, when it would obviously not succeed. We couldn't possibly stay with it. The Senate, the press, and the public wouldn't be about to let us escalate something up to the level that it would have a chance of winning. And uh, it would be highly damaging to the nation and to the, the CIA particularly to, to let ourselves get dragged into some such a thing. Once, and at the outset, when they offered me this job, then I had a choice of, uh, you know, what do I do? Do I participate, or do I resign, or do I quietly lobby for a, 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 you know, some other job and let someone else run the Angola program? And my decision was that I was going to stay with the program because it was too interesting to see how does the United States get dragged into these things and how does the CIA conduct them once it's in them. I don't think anybody could, could turn down that kind of an opportunity. Just to know that it's not what some uh, newspaperman is telling you what happens when he doesn't really know himself. It's what's really happening. You were there running it. So I decided to participate. And in order to make sure that I remained on the inside, I remained a good, good soldier throughout the whole thing. I did not uh, balk or fight it until we got into phases that I thought were just uh, beyond the pale, such as alliances with the South Africans and mercenaries, for example. When I went to Angola, I was sent out there to come back with a military assessment. And uh, that's what I recommended when I got back. If you guys want to win, we can do it a dramatic weapon, uh, a horrendous weapon, if you will, 
uh, against the MPLA at that time would have just brushed them aside. It would have decimated them. It would have uh, wiped them out. And uh, the FNLA would have been into Rwanda in a few moments' time. Well, suppose they had taken your military recommendation. How would you have felt? I would have uh, stayed as task force chief and participated. I, uh, if, if you're going to do something, you know, if you're going to learn French or a foreign language, the least you can do with your poor pronunciation is uh, speak out. And I think it's, uh, there are certain things that are criminal, uh, but you compound it by losing. If you're going to go into Angola, if you have some national compulsion to go into Angola, at least the United States position would be much stronger if you won. And uh, if they had uh, accepted my recommendation at that point, I would have been uh, much happier uh, if, if they had gone ahead and won than I was with uh, the contemptible middle ground that they followed. Could we interrupt a minute to just take a look at this house and how it's manicured, the yard, the, on the, right, the one on the right. I would not be comfortable in such an environment. I think as we drive, uh, we can continue talking about other things, but maybe Haskell, you can catch a few yeah. of these beautiful, look at this place on the, can you get under the trees with yeah. that? Can you get a look at that? I mean, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's very comfortable. I would be more comfortable in that place than the palace that we just looked at, but nevertheless, that little house is a, probably $150,000 or more. The overall life overseas is very agreeable. I think it's one of the things that a lot of men in the CIA want to, they want to stay out overseas. It's uh, kind of a colonialist existence. There are lots of servants and uh, the life is very easy. The housing is very adequate, if not plush. We had about six white kids in our class and then, um, you know, everybody just blended in. It was, you know, a little bit of, um, like, racism or whatever on the teacher's part in that, you know, she thought that the black kids were a little deprived and everything. But, you know, in the schools, everybody got along. It was a pleasant place for kids to grow up. I mean that you're living with the elite of that society in terms of education basically and experiences. There are people who've traveled and people who, who, who've uh, been involved in a lot of experiences in life, you know, ambassadors and the people who are running the country and uh, the diplomats in different embassies. And uh, so they're sharp people, they're intelligent people and they're, they're well bred generally. So the conduct is uh, relatively high, a sense of culture. When we were in Africa, I don't remember everything, but I didn't, I don't remember so much about the school. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, when we were there, we, we'd go on our safaris, and we climbed Kenya and ran all over the place. We were ambitious doing it. He was a little older and longer legged, so he could go on hunting safaris. Mel was just uh, a year, about a year too young. He just couldn't quite uh, pull it off, although he did a lot of the jogging with us. Cheating. He's supposed to give us a little bit to get <laughs> to get pumped up. Oh, oh yeah. One more. Good one. Good one. Good one. Good up. Okay, come up. Come up. Okay. Now yeah, you try. This is about ninety pounds. It's a highly competitive business, and you're working on distress. You go to the same cocktail parties that the State Department officers go to, and then a dinner party after the cocktail party, but in between you go meet an agent. 
and you pay him off and you get a receipt and uh, you rush up to the embassy and stow the stuff so it won't fall out of your pocket at the dinner party or something. And then you go to the dinner party and then after the dinner party you go run another errand. And this goes on day in and day out, Saturdays, Sundays, holidays. And when you begin to see that the, the organization as a whole is very sloppy and poorly run and the standards are very low, you're, it's hard to stay motivated. It's hard to keep thinking it's worthwhile. And you really get to a state where you just, just really don't want to have to lock everything about your professional life in a safe and lie to all of the people you know about who you really are and what you're really doing and what your real dreams and aspirations and promotions are and be able to complain to them about your failures or, or our problems. Well, I realize now that the business of the CIA is to go out and to corrupt individuals in their in place in their own countries, and uh, that this is something that corrupts oneself. This was going against his upbringing, which was a strong Christian, very moral background, and he was coming into conflict with himself hating himself, angry with himself. You know, I would like to, to present myself as a man of intense principle who saw bad things and immediately resigned and, and disgust, but my career was obviously going quite well. Uh, I had the prestige of people coming to me for jobs, coming to me for advice, inviting me to lunch, wanting to play tennis with me. Uh, this is, you know, obviously a human satisfaction. I was not yet uh, in top management. I couldn't really give away a lot of jobs, but I could speak on the behalf of someone. My income was about $33,000 a year. In 10 years, I could retire on a $21,000 a year pension for the rest of my life. I had total security. Was it the thought that you would be continuing to do things like the Vietnam involvement and in the Angola involvement that you thought was uh, immoral or Counterproductive, at least. Well, what I tried to do was to psych myself into going back to Africa as a chief of station in some place like Khartoum, for example, which would have been a nice post for my grade, and uh, just not push covert operations very much. If something came along that was just sort of irresistible, some agent that just had to be recruited will let an officer in my station recruit him, but basically just play a lot of tennis and let the paychecks come in. This is uh, traditionally what uh, burned out senior case officers do. And I muddled and, and waffled and vacillated and rationalized for about eight months before I could tear myself away. I, I don't really look at it as uh, taking that much uh, guts to quit. I just sort of didn't have any choice by November and December, I had intense pains in my abdomen, which were obviously the precursors of a, a stomach ulcer from the internal conflict of wanting to hang on to this career, but not respecting it. I had requested many times that Bob just drop out of the CIA, just get out and start life anew someplace. Um, he wasn't able to do so when I asked him to, but now he has. He's seen even more since our divorce. and. Um, Yes, I do feel vindicated when a man comes back and says you were right all along. Everything you ever said was right. Everything you ever said about everybody who walked into our house was right. What lessons did you learn from your dad's experience? Well, of course, it brings up values just all over the place. And that, <laughs> that I mean, I could go, you could break up on that a whole lot. But, you know, I'm listening to him right now. I'm learning. <laughs> this is something else. What's your reaction to CIA now, Mel? I think up high they're slobs, and then you know, down in the lower, when you get down into the um, people who are actually out in the field, then they would do the work, you know. It strikes me as, you know, very inefficient, crooked, really just sloppy organization. Well, suppose they were efficient, and suppose they were neat, you know, real professional and perfect. Yeah, I'd like them. <laughs> Simple as that, I guess. I'm like, if they were the elite, I would like them. I was not a, a man at peace with himself. And since I resigned, I do not feel in a position of conflict. I feel in a position of being at peace with myself morally.